man is always in a state of identification. Only the object of identification changes. A man identifies with a small problem which confronts him and he completely forgets the great aims with which he began his work. He identifies with one thought and forgets other thoughts. He is identified with one feeling, with one mood and forgets his own wider thoughts, emotions and moods. In work on themselves people are so much identified with separate aims that they fail to see the wood for the trees. Two or three trees nearest to them represent for them the whole wood. Identifying is one of our most terrible foes because it penetrates everywhere and deceives a man at the moment when it seems to him that he is struggling with it. It is especially difficult to free oneself from identifying because a man naturally becomes more easily identified with the things that interest him most, to which he gives his time, his work and his attention. In order to free himself from identifying, a man must be constantly on guard and be merciless with himself. That is, he must not be afraid of seeing all the subtle and hidden forms which identifying takes. It is necessary to see and to study identifying to its very roots in oneself. The difficulty of struggling with identifying is still further increased by the fact that when people observe it in themselves, they consider it a very good trait and call it enthusiasm, zeal, passion, spontaneity, inspiration and names of that kind and they consider that only in a state of identifying can a man really produce good work no matter in what sphere. In reality of course this is illusion. Man cannot do anything sensible when he is in a state of identifying. If people could see what the state of identifying means they would alter their opinions. A man becomes a thing, a piece of flesh, he loses even the small semblance of a human being that he has. In the East, where people smoke hashish and other drugs, it often happens that a man becomes so identified with his pipe that he begins to consider he is a pipe himself. This is not a joke but a fact. He actually becomes a pipe. This is identifying. And for this, hashish or opium are entirely unnecessary. Look at people in shops, in theatres, in restaurants, or see how they identify with words when they argue about something or try to prove something, particularly something they do not know themselves. They become greediness, desires or words. Of themselves nothing remains. Identifying is the chief obstacle to self-remembering. A man who identifies with anything is unable to remember himself. In order to remember oneself, it is necessary, first of all, not to identify. But in order to learn not to identify, man must first of all not be identified with himself, must not call himself I always and on all occasions. He must remember that there are two in him, that there is himself, that is I in him, and there is another with whom he must struggle and whom he must conquer if he wishes at any time to attain anything. So long as a man identifies or can be identified, he is the slave of everything that can happen to him. Freedom is first of all freedom from identification. After general forms of identification, attention must be given to a particular form of identifying, namely identifying with people, which takes the form of considering them. There are several different kinds of considering. On the most prevalent occasions, a man is identified with what others think about him, how they treat him, what attitude they show towards him. He always thinks that people do not value him enough, are not sufficiently polite and courteous. All this torments him, makes him think and suspect and lose an immense amount of energy on guesswork, on suppositions, develops in him a distrustful and hostile attitude towards people how somebody looked at him, what somebody thought of him, what somebody said of him. All this acquires for him an immense signification. And he considers not only separate persons, but society and historically constituted conditions. Everything that pleases such a man seems to him to be unjust, illegal, wrong and illogical. And the point of departure for his judgment is always that these things can and should be changed. 
Injustice is one of the words in which very often considering hides itself. When a man has convinced himself that he is indignant with some injustice, then for him to stop considering would mean reconciling himself to injustice. There are people who are able to consider not only injustice or the failure of others to value them enough, but who are able to consider, for example, the weather. This seems ridiculous, but it is a fact. People are able to consider climate, heat, cold, snow, rain. They can be irritated by the weather, be indignant and angry with it. A man can take everything in such a personal way as though everything in the world had been specially arranged in order to give him pleasure, or on the contrary, to cause him inconvenience or unpleasantness. All this and much else besides is merely a form of identification. Such considering is wholly based upon requirements. A man inwardly requires that everyone should see what a remarkable man he is and that they should constantly give expression to their respect, esteem and admiration for him, for his intellect, his beauty, his cleverness, his wit, his presence of mind, his originality and all his other qualities. Requirements in their turn are based on a completely fantastic notion about themselves, such as very often occurs with people of very modest appearance. Various writers, actors, musicians, artists and politicians, for instance, are almost without exception sick people. And what are they suffering from? First of all, from an extraordinary opinion of themselves, then from requirements, and then from considering. That is, being ready and prepared beforehand to take offence at lack of understanding and lack of appreciation. There is still another form of considering which can take a great deal of energy from a man. This form starts with a man beginning to think that he is not considering another person enough, that this other person is offended with him for not considering him sufficiently. And he begins to think himself that perhaps he does not think enough about this other, does not pay him enough attention, does not give way to him enough. All this is simply weakness. People are afraid of one another. But this can lead very far. I have seen many such cases. In this way a man can finally lose his balance, if at any time he had any, and begin to perform entirely senseless actions. He gets angry with himself and feels that it is stupid and he cannot stop. Whereas in such cases the whole point is precisely not to consider. It is the same case, only perhaps worse, when a man considers that in his opinion he ought to do something when, as a matter of fact, he ought not to do so at all. Ought and ought not is also a difficult subject, that is, difficult to understand when a man really ought and when he ought not. This can be approached only from the point of view of aim. When a man has an aim, he ought to do only what leads him towards his aim, and he ought not to do anything that hinders him from going towards his aim. As I've already said, people very often think that if they begin to struggle with considering within themselves, it will make them insincere. And they are afraid of this because they think that in this event they will be losing something, losing a part of themselves. In this case, the same thing takes place as in attempts to struggle against the outward expression of unpleasant emotions. The sole difference is that in one case a man struggles with the outward expression of emotions and in the other case with an inner manifestation of perhaps the same emotions. This fear of losing sincerity is of course self-deception, one of those formulas of lying upon on which human weaknesses are based. Man cannot help identifying and considering inwardly, and he cannot help expressing his unpleasant emotions simply because he is weak. Identifying, considering, the expression of unpleasant emotions are manifestations of his weakness, his impotence, his inability to control himself. But not wishing to acknowledge this weakness to himself, he calls it sincerity or honesty, and he tells himself that he does not want to struggle against sincerity, whereas, as in fact he is unable to struggle against his weaknesses. Sincerity and honesty are in reality something quite different. What a man calls sincerity in this case is in reality simply being unwilling to restrain himself. 
and deep down inside him a man is aware of this. But he lies to himself when he says that he does not want to lose sincerity.